It's Tuesday, November 22nd. The warning signs were there, so how did law enforcement miss them? We start here. We do not tolerate bias motivated crimes in this community. The man accused of opening fire on an LGBTQ nightclub was known to police. Somebody that police had interacted with, they were not able to stop. Why authorities are struggling to stop hate crimes. A deal with rail unions was supposed to be full steam ahead. There are still four groups that have not ratified this contract. Now a strike could come just in time for the holidays. And RSV isn't just going after kids. You see your kids getting the parents sick and then the grandparents sick, and that's where you have this you know, real concern of hospitalizations and deaths. Why doctors are sounding the alarm about the virus in adults. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Elizabeth Schulze. Hey there, Brad's off today. I'll be taking you through the news, starting with the latest on that horrific shooting at Club Q in Colorado Springs. Thank you, everybody, for being here uh, to cover this incredibly important event, uh, just a horrific and, and sad and tragic event. Late Monday, authorities confirmed the names of at least five victims who died after a gunman entered the LGBTQ club overnight on Saturday, firing his assault-style rifle into the crowd. You know, too often, uh, society loses track of the victims of these sad and tragic events in all the talk about the suspect. The five lives lost include 40-year-old Kelly Loving, bartender Derek Rump. His mother confirming his passing, saying he was a kind and loving person with a heart of gold. Daniel Aston, who worked with Derek and performed at the club. His mother Sabrina is still processing that he's gone. It's just a nightmare that you can't wake up from. Ashley Pa and Raymond Green Vance. We're absolutely devastated by the loss of Ashley. She meant everything to this family and we can't even begin to understand what it will mean to not have her in our lives. At least 17 others were injured because of a gunshot wound. And authorities say there could have been even more victims if other brave people inside the club hadn't taken action to stop the gunman. Two heroes, two people inside that club ran at the attacker and beat him with one of his own guns. They are Thomas James and Richard Fierro. Yesterday, we also learned that the alleged suspect is facing murder and hate crime charges. Let's bring in ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky. Aaron, what's the latest on the investigation here? So the authorities, Elizabeth, seem to have settled on hate as at least part of the motive. The placeholder charges Maybe not the final charges that the suspect is prosecuted on, but at least initially indicate murder and bias crimes, which is the hate crime statute in Colorado. And so that does give us a sense that authorities believe that this act was motivated by some kind of anti-gay animus. We do not tolerate bias motivated crimes in this community, that we support communities that have been maligned, harassed and intimidated and abused. And that's one way that we can do that, showing that we will... Uh, put the money uh, where our mouth is, essentially. And that's what it looked like from the beginning. The mayor told ABC News that this had all the hallmarks of of some kind of a, a hate crime. The motive is still under investigation. It has the trappings of a hate crime, uh, but uh, we're going to have to see what the investigation follow, uh, shows in terms of, you know, social media and things like that uh, to make a clear determination exactly what the motive was. And that tells us something about the times we're living in because anti-gay rhetoric online is some of the most uh, prevalent and violent extremist content there is and and it's only been increasing right you know you've been doing a lot of reporting about this broader context of rising hate crimes people being targeted just for being who they are why are we seeing these numbers go up so much right now Aaron Analysts say there are a couple of things that that may be behind this. One, we have a lot of anger in the country, and social media is a place where some of that anger is not only encouraged but often validated sometimes by, say, celebrities who endorse what would otherwise be fringe views. Officials condemning this message referencing Kanye West, now known as Ye, saying he was right about the Jews seen scrolling outside a college football game Saturday. There are really four tranches of hate speech that are the most widely shared on the internet when it comes to extremist content. Anti-gay, anti-Jew, anti-black and anti-government. The post call for violence against Vice President Pence and Speaker Pelosi specifically. The concern is that that speech then flips into action. 
that gives law enforcement a whole new challenge because they can't police every nook of the Internet, but they have to identify what the likely targets are and who the likely uh, uh, perpetrators would be. And, and so far, law enforcement has really struggled to, to do just that every single time. And I guess that's sort of the question. You know, this alleged suspect, he had been flagged. Uh, Why isn't law enforcement, Aaron, better able to prevent these types of attacks, especially when so many of those threats are publicly posted online? Most of our system relies on an arrest and a prosecution in order to actually pop a flag on someone. And, And that system has just proved deficient. This is your boy. I've got the heads outside. Look at that. They got a beat on me. The alleged Club Q shooter live streamed this video on Facebook the day he was arrested in connection to a bomb threat. This suspect in Colorado Springs was arrested in June of 2021 for making an alleged threat against his mother involving a homemade bomb and and weapons. You can see the suspect wearing body armor before that arrest and hear him making threats. If they breach, I'm going to blow it to holy hell. Even though no explosives were found, he was charged with menacing and kidnapping, but the case does not appear to have been adjudicated, so it did not raise any flags on a background check when it came time for the suspect to legally purchase the assault-style rifle that police say was used in the shooting. Um, Colorado has very restrictive sealing laws. Uh, what that means is that if a case is filed in a courtroom in the state of Colorado and it is dismissed for any reason, whether that is because the prosecution dismisses it or the court dismisses it, uh, it is automatically sealed. That and is a change it doesn't appear that law enforcement, even if they sealed the case and didn't prosecute, they wouldn't be precluded from trying to do something else to maybe flag that this person represented a threat. And, and that's where the system kind of breaks down. There is no alternative absent police and prosecution. Mm. And are we seeing this kind of heightened awareness now from police, given the rise in hate crimes more broadly? The police and and law enforcement officers at at every level are always monitoring sites where uh, extremist content is posted. That's how, for example, in New York City, uh, some tweets were flagged and and a threat was probably diffused involving the Jewish community and uh, an attack on a, on a synagogue in New York City, two people arrested, and, and now the New York State Police uh, and, and the NYPD saying they're going to provide more protection to the Jewish community and, and sites associated with, with Jews. And uh, so police are, are, are oftentimes very good at identifying potential threats, but as I say, they can't do every single one. But here in, in the case of Colorado Springs, somebody that police had interacted with, they were not able to stop. That was left to patrons of the nightclub. Yeah, a lot to boil down there. Aaron Katursky, thanks so much, as always, for keeping us on it. Thanks, Elizabeth. Next up on Start Here, it was all about backlogs at the ports last holiday season. This year, we could be barreling toward another backup on railroads. That's after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. 
my favorite show. It's lunchtime in America. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us for everything you need to know. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Remember how a couple of months ago we heard warnings that rail workers were about to go on strike and basically shut down much of the transportation of goods across the country? At the last minute, President Biden stepped in and helped broker a deal with several unions. This agreement is validation, validation of what I've always believed. Unions and management can work together. But it didn't last long. Yesterday, one of the unions representing train and engine service members rejected the agreement, so now it's back to the drawing board. ABC's Sam Sweeney covers transportation and has been following this. Sam, I thought this was a done deal. What happened? Look, the Biden administration stepped in and they thought they had a deal together, uh, but it went back to the unions and a number of the unions did ratify this and accepted the agreement that was brokered by the White House. But there are still four groups that have not ratified this contract. And what that means is that as early as December 5th, there could be uh, some sort of a strike across the entire country. And this is an all or nothing. So if one union uh, doesn't ratify and doesn't accept the terms of these new contracts, all of the unions would stop working because they wouldn't cross the picket line. What are some of the sticking points here? Why is this so hard to kind of reach an agreement between these different unions at this point in time? The workers say they are, are burnout. You know, during the pandemic, they had these crazy schedules. They hadn't had a contract in several years. The industry should be realizing that they have been exposed as, as a group that pushed too hard, too fast, and it, it's time to, to have a more humane method of treating your workers. Uh, and some of the big sticking points were actually vacation time, sick time. You know, are they able to take off uh, to go to the doctor for themselves or their children without being penalized? And the railroad companies are saying, look, we run strict schedules because of the nature of this business. Trains are moving across the country. We need to have a reliable staff in place. And the unions and, and, the, and the workers are saying, well, our life is really being impacted by this and, and we need better conditions. So again, it's not about pay. It's about this work-life balance. And is there a sense that this strike really could happen this time around, Sam? You know, what happens if they don't ratify an agreement by this deadline in the next couple of weeks? Absolutely, it's possible, but Congress could step in at the 11th hour and demand that they keep working. This has happened before. Uh, in the mid to late 90s, American Airlines pilots said, we're going to go on strike and we're going to do it over a busy holiday. One minute after midnight tonight, I directed our strike chairman to my right to shut down American Airlines. And the Clinton administration said, eh, not so fast. You're one of the largest airlines in the world. It would have crippling effects. We will always comply with federal law. Pilots are doing their jobs. They're back flying the aircraft. 
back to the bargaining table. You're going to continue to work and you're going to figure this out. Not what we're hoping to have just in time for the holidays here. <laughs> Major implications. On a monetary level, we're talking about $2 billion a day to the economy. But think about everything that rail touches from food to water to chemicals uh, to products that are moving across the country, uh, emptying out ports that are already backed up for, uh, with shipping containers. Uh, and then you have the workers involved. And also you have commuter train lines that are involved that use these tracks that wouldn't be able to move otherwise. So major cities would feel the impact of this uh, on that level as well. So what does this mean for, you know, you and me sitting at home? Are the gifts that we order for the holidays going to be delayed? I mean, a strike sounds pretty serious, Sam. It is serious, but the good news when it comes to Christmas and the holidays is that the gifts that you are going to be giving, they are already in warehouses. They're already on store shelves. Uh, they are ready to go out. And th that happens, you know, late in the summer into September when all of that gets sorted out. So the good news is, yes, your holiday packages will be good. Truckers will be extra busy. Uh, where we're really concerned are are chemicals, uh, farming equipment, shipments that are leaving full of wheat that are going to ports, and then the stuff that is coming into ports right now. You know, we have a, a ship comes into the port of Long Beach or into New York City with thousands of containers. Well, they are typically put on, yes, trucks, but also trains to get uh, to different parts of the country. And that's where we could still see those serious issues. Those backups at ports, not what any of us want to see this holiday season again. Thanks so much for following this for us, Sam. Thanks for having me. We've been hearing a lot about the triple threat of COVID, the flu, and RSV among children right now. It's putting enormous strain on the nation's hospitals, schools, and parents. In probably the course of like two hours, she'd gone from like being our normal baby to she was on a respirator. New government data shows that more than 100,000 parents missed work last month because of childcare problems. And that's actually higher than at any other time during the pandemic. And it turns out more adults are actually getting sick with these respiratory viruses, including RSV. So let's bring in Dr. John Brownstein. He is the chief innovation officer at Boston Children's Hospital and an ABC News contributor. Dr. Brownstein, it seemed like RSV was mostly a concern among kids. Like, is it true adults are also at risk here? Yeah, well, RSV is a concern broadly in the population. Yes, we're worried about the youngest kids that have challenges dealing with this infection, especially with their smaller airways. But in fact, the greatest amount of RSV hospitalizations and deaths actually happen in the older populations. I know the focus is absolutely on our pediatric population. They're vulnerable. Our pediatric hospitals are, are dealing with the surge. We have stretchers in the hallway. We have children um, being treated in chairs in the hallway. We're all working extra hours and pulling extra shifts to try to help out, um, but we're still having difficulty overcoming the patient volumes. But then we also have this you know, concern about older adults, um, the elderly, those with chronic health conditions, weakened immune systems. That's where we've seen a high number of hospitalizations. It's one of the more common causes of pneumonia in the elderly. We need to protect ourselves against RSV also. If you look at CDC surveillance over the past nine years, we're way ahead of where we are at this point in the season, really across nine years. And from 2021 to 2022 season, we're about 2x higher, but really we're, we're far greater than that when you look even, even beyond. Well, the last time we saw hospitalizations this high this early in the season was more than a decade ago. This more is a concern because it's showing no signs of letting up. Hopefully, we will just have an earlier peak as opposed to a more significant peak. But the data is not suggesting that we're taking, we've turned any corners just about yet. I guess we've been hearing a lot about how kids are getting sicker because they don't have some of that immunity over the past few years because they've been inside during the pandemic. Why would it be that it's higher among adults? You know, we've had years to build up immunity at this point, right? Sure, we, we have, but immunity wanes over time. And, you know, we, just like COVID, we're concerned about, you know, keeping our antibodies up. And so, Many people in the adult population will lose their immunity, and we know this is especially true for those with weakened immune systems. So, you know, the COVID issues apply more generally across the population. We've been isolated. We haven't been challenged with these respiratory viruses. You bring everybody together. You bring the kids together. They start spreading this virus across, you know, their population, but then it starts moving into older age groups. And that's why you see your kids getting the parents sick and then the grandparents sick. 
And that's where you have this, you know, real concern of hospitalizations and deaths. And that's my next question. You know, what are the symptoms to look out for with RSV in adults? How do you know if this is any different than COVID or the flu or just your regular cold? You, you don't. You know, it's the same issues of, of fever and cough and fatigue. You know, it's not really any different or it's very hard to distinguish. You know, there's some minor, you know, differences. Obviously, COVID had this this signature loss of taste and smell. That's changed over time. You know, we don't really have an ability to, to know other than get tested. And testing is available, especially, you know, from your healthcare provider. You know, obviously, you can get a COVID test pretty easily. There are flu tests out there that's a little bit more challenging. You can get tested for RSV. So yeah, knowing uh, is important. I think it's helpful. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it, you're doing the same. It's about rest, hydration, you know, the general things that you do with any, you know, cough. Obviously, if those symptoms get worse, you really should be talking to your healthcare provider. So if you do test positive for any of these things, should you be isolating? Like, are we going back to a world where you're stuck inside? What's the treatment here? This is, it's a really interesting problem because these other viruses, you know, in some ways are starting to look very similar to COVID. They're causing surges, they're causing impact on our hospitals. They called 911, rushed her to the hospital where they tried to intubate her seven times. And then they had to do CPR for four and a half minutes because they lost her heartbeat. You know, what do we do? I think realistically, if we can stay home when we're sick, that's ideal regardless of which virus it is. You want to protect others. You want to make sure that you don't spread these viruses and create a surge. And I'm very worried about a post-Thanksgiving surge, absolutely. So whatever we can do now in terms of limiting, limiting risk, limiting the ability to pass on infection. I know that this is a challenging time because everybody wants to spend time with their families, but whatever you can do that might involve masking, improving ventilation in your house, you know, all the th things that we learned from COVID, they apply to RSV and of course the flu as well. Gosh, hard to imagine that we're back in this world where we're talking about a Thanksgiving surge again. Dr. Brownstein, thank you so much for breaking this all down. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Coming up, Bob Iger is back, and Disney investors are wishing upon a star that he'll make the streaming business profitable. One last thing is next. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like... Your health, your money. Breaking news, exclusives. Pop culture, and with the biggest stars. Music, trends, style. And some laughs. And some good food. You got me you know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. And one last thing. You could almost hear a collective gasp all the way from Hollywood to Wall Street late Sunday night when the Walt Disney Company, which owns ABC News, unexpectedly announced that Bob Iger is back as CEO. My first reaction was this is a hoax. This has to be some kind of internet hoax. That's Cynthia Littleton, the co-editor-in-chief of Variety. She says the entertainment world was stunned by Disney's decision to bring back Iger to lead the company. These are the things that I've learned along the way. I've tried to really impart to the people who 
have worked closest with me. He'd been CEO for 15 years before stepping down in 2020. Bob Iger is like the Michael Jordan of CEOs. He's just almost universally regarded in a town where there's a lot of hate <laughs> and hate rooting for people. I mean, people just love Bob. He's rejoining Disney at a tumultuous time for the company and the broader media industry. Disney's stock price had dropped about 40% just this year before it rebounded some 6% yesterday on the news of Iger's return. Investors had been especially concerned about the company's most recent earnings report, showing big losses in its streaming business, Disney+. Plus. And Disney isn't the only one struggling to make streaming profitable. Not only did they have to invest in new platforms and new content, but they had to take old content that outside distributors and companies would pay them for and say, no, we're not going to take your checks anymore. Companies from Disney to Netflix to Amazon have poured billions of dollars into new content. Are you guilty or not guilty, sir? Guilty of being the god of mischief, yes. Think of spin-offs of the Marvel or Star Wars franchises, or original series like The Crown. Unreliable tribal leaders in eccentric costumes. But isn't that all I am, Prime Minister? a tribal leader in eccentric costume. And analysts say intense competition in the space has kept subscriber prices so low that it doesn't offset those big production costs. The streaming rise has created what Hollywood calls the content boom, which means everybody's stretched thin. So what to do to offset some of the costs? One obvious answer is raising prices. Apple TV and Disney Plus recently hiked monthly subscriber fees. Another option is advertising. Basically, put commercials into streaming shows so they look a lot more like what you're used to seeing on old-fashioned TV. Then there's a the possibility of mergers, or just plain cutting back on the content. At some point, it does become Economics 101. There is too much capital chasing too much content. People cannot possibly watch it all. And so we're all still waiting for the ending in this streaming battle, in a tale that's most definitely not as old as time. You can catch more on all these stories at abcnews.com or the ABC News app. I'm Elizabeth Schulze. Brad's back tomorrow. I'll see you later. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like your health, your money, breaking news, exclusives, pop culture, and with the biggest stars, music, trends, style, and some laughs and some good food. You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200.